Well, hey, good afternoon, everybody. This is Patrick from the Poison Pen Bookstore, and we're here with our friend Mete, Mete Ivy Harrison. I always blow the first name. Is it Mete or Mete? Um, it's a Danish name, and it's supposed to be pronounced Meta, but my mother's yeah. name is Betty, and so she and my family has always pronounced it to rhyme with Betty, so Mete. Mete, Mete. Uh, she's here with her, we're just talking about it, just a terrific, gutsy, brave new book, The Prodigal Daughter, uh, which is the fifth, as you know, in her Linda Walheim series, and uh, there's so much going on in this book. Um, let's just jump right into it. Um, but first of all, before we do, I should say, before we jump right into it, I just want to talk to everybody watching on Facebook. If you have uh, questions for Meti, go ahead and put them in the comments field. And I'm flying solo here at the bookstore, but I'll do my best to keep my eyes on the on the comments so uh, I can ask her some of your questions as well. Um, let's start by, before we get kind of up to speed on book five, Tell us a little bit about, I know you've answered this a bazillion times probably <laughs> recently too, but you have a really interesting story. Um, can you talk a little bit about you know, where you grew up and I understand you were one of 11 children and you're a triathlete and you know, PhD and tell us a little bit about, <laughs> about yourself. Sometimes it feels like I've lived three different lives. Um, yeah, I grew up on a little farm in New Jersey, central New Jersey. I know people think of New Jersey as the armpit of the world, but central New Jersey lives up to the Garden State moniker. And we had a horse and chickens and a dog. And we were the Waltons, I think, <laughs> in, in real life. And um, But my dad worked for Bell Labs and was a really early computer scientist and eventually went to Brigham Young University and taught computer science there. Six of my brothers, all six of my brothers are computer programmers. Two of my sisters are computer programmers. And I am, I think the only um, really artistic one. I, I have one sister who is a visual artist and she has given up and gone back to computer programming because it pays money. <laughs> so you're the and, only one, you're the only one on the, on the right side of the brain, huh? It's very strange. I do live in a very left brain family. Um, yeah. And in many ways, I'm still very left brain. Um, I think my triathlon career is very left brain. I wake up every morning. I have a schedule. I always do exactly what's listed on the schedule. Um, I, I like structure in my life. I like goal setting. Um, but, but writing has been this part of me that's, I, I am a pantser. I don't, I don't plan out books. I just write what comes to me each day. And it's this one part of my life that is very different than the rest of my life. So yeah, I got a PhD in German literature from Princeton when I was 24. Um, I was a prodigy and I hated being a prodigy. I couldn't wait until I was 30 and got treated like an adult, which did eventually happen. Um, now I'm 50 and, and mostly get treated as an adult. So <laughs> no, no more prodigy. What did you specialize in, in German literature? Was it Goethe or what were no, you? I was sort of forced to do Goethe. Um, I wanted to do my dissertation on Sophie von La Roche. Uh, she was a contemporary of Goethe's, um, and wrote I don't know, dozens and dozens of very, very popular uh, women's literature for women and girls during that late 18th century time period. Really? And I, I went to Germany and found some of those old books. They're not considered literary, so they're hard to find. Anyway, I loved reading her, but um, Princeton made me do half of the dissertation on her and half on Goethe. And then I was always frustrated with that. <laughs> Oh, but, you did. You had to write about Goethe. I just was bringing that up as kind of a joke. <laughs> um, they really twisted my arm um, and said that I wouldn't be able to get a job if I uh, only studied a minor uh, female poet, and so, so they female writer. So they they were pretty insistent that I needed to do Goethe as well. Yeah. So it was so, half him and half her. Was she like the uh, Louisa May Alcott of? Germany? Definitely. She, right? she um, supported her entire family. She had eight kids, I think. She supported her family by her writing. She was very, like I say, very popular. Nobody knows who she is, Sophie von La Roche, but um, 
I find her books really interesting, even though she's not, I mean, she wasn't, a, she wasn't poetic. She wasn't a literary writer, but the storylines are always fascinating. Anyway, so that, that's what my, I, I had, that was my dissertation. I also had a, a specialty in Dada. Oh, really? <laughs> yes. So right. that, that's my other little bent. I love Dadaism. I love yeah. expressionism. Kandinsky is my favorite artist. So that whole weird. period, um, and don't worry, folks, we'll start talking about her books, but <laughs> that whole period, you know, of uh, kind of the Weimar era. And um, uh, my wife and I are really into this stuff. And we have you ever heard of um, Anita Berber? that expressionist uh, performer and dancer. Remember. It's been a while, but I, I may have heard her name, but if so, I've forgotten. And all, you know, Fritz Lang and all that early German. Yes, Fritz Lang, I definitely remember. Uh, in film noir, just wonderful, wonderful stuff. Yeah. Um, and then, okay, so you've, as, as a writer, you've published a lot. You've done a lot of young adult uh, fiction, um, a lot of, what would you call it, Mormon Mormon themed uh, nonfiction and fiction? Um, I don't know that I've done any nonfiction. I mean, I, I publish essays. That's probably what you mean. I, I, for a long yeah. time, I published every week at Huffington. And I, I still occasionally publish things. Um, my life has become more difficult. And so I, I don't, I have a full time job. So it's harder for me to have time to do those sorts of things. But um, yeah. Uh, yeah, I, I still consider myself Mormon. I still have uh, another Mormon book that's coming out this year, um, the, uh, the second part of the Women's Book of Mormon. And I, I don't know, I love Mormonism, <laughs> despite the fact that I think if people accuse me of trying to destroy it, I, I just love it. <laughs> yeah. Um, well, that actually comes through a lot in, in the books, you know, that, uh, that sort of inner conflict that Linda goes through throughout the, the course of these five books so far. Um, it, it's where does, I mean, the obvious question an, outs, an outside person would ask would be, where does Linda end and Metty begin? Uh, I mean, there's a lot of shared biography there. Any, any comments about that? So I, I know people always think that I'm Linda. Right. And there, there definitely are things where I allow my ideas come out, to come out Linda. So when, when Linda joined the Mama Dragons, for instance, that's a group that I'm part of. And th that was me putting in my biography into Linda. But when I first conceived of her, I didn't think of her as me. Because when I wrote The Bishop's Wife, I was pretty firmly an atheist. And um, I was looking for the kind of Mormon woman that if, if I believed again, could I be that kind of a Mormon woman? So I was looking outside of myself at, I, I, my friends, I have a number of friends from my Princeton days who know who they are and they know that I modeled Linda on them. And we're great friends, but I, I was not them at the beginning. And I, I planned from the very first that Linda was headed out of the church. I, I don't know if people think that I, I planned, I, I charted that out for her because I was doing that myself. That was, it was never my intention to stop attending church or to have this massive upheaval in my life. Um, it, that just happened along the way, accidentally almost, as I was exploring ideas. Um, but, but I planned for Linda to leave because I thought that would be a much more dramatic story to tell <laughs> than right. um, her staying or becoming more firmly committed to the church. And, and I have always written for a national audience and not for a Mormon audience. Yeah. Um, if, I had, if I had thought that this book might be popular with Mormons, I probably would have written the series very differently. But it, it was always intended for a non-Mormon audience. And that's what, what I have you know, had in mind. That's the, the that's who I'm speaking to. There, mm. Mormons sometimes will complain about the books that that I go on and on explaining things that are obvious to everyone. I find that amusing because <laughs> they're obvious to Mormons, but I'm obvious. I'm speaking quite clearly to an audience of people who doesn't who don't understand yeah, absolutely Mormon things. So that's by gift, I suppose, to non Mormons and the annoying feature to Mormons who read the books. Well, it's interesting because there is, you know, to those of us who are not, you know, part of that part of that group, 
um, there is a certain sense of otherness attached to it. You know, um, it's a very, at least from an outsider's perspective, it's a very closed, insular, yes. insular system. You know, not unlike some other, you know, similar groups, you know, uh, religious groups. But, um, you know, in each of the books so far, you've really dealt with, you know, very serious so societal issues and how they kind of bump up against Mormonism, you know, or, or the, I'm not sure, I don't want to speak for you, but, you know, issues of LGB, LGBTQ um, issues, you know, obviously racism, um, you know, in this new book, we, we talk about, uh, well, set, you know, sexual abuse and, um, you know, and, and uh, homelessness, youth homelessness are, are big front and center issues in this new book. Um, I know, I know people use the phrase sexual assault, but I would call this a book about rape culture. Rape culture. And, okay. About, um, and then about the unique Mormon angle. There are many things about rape culture within Mormonism that are the same as everywhere else. Mm. But I wanted this book to be about the things that are a little different about, you know, what rape culture is. And when I say rape culture, I mean the ways in which women are blamed for their own sexual assaults and the ways in which men are excused from these or protected or um, even congratulated perhaps in some ways. So I wanted to have a Mormon bent on, on rape culture um, and be able to talk about scriptures. And, and for instance, missions. Missions are a vital, vital part of the Mormon male experience in particular and how that relates in this book to you know, Mormon rape culture is really an important part of how it plays out and the protection of the of the young men who are involved in this assault. Is there sort of an unspoken what happens on the mission stays in the mission sort of <laughs> cultural feeling? No, no, no. It's it's That's sort of the opposite. It's like everything that happens before the mission it is what happened in Vegas. We know we don't speak of that, right? Anything right. that happens before your mission, you clear up, you repent, and then it's gone because you need to go on a mission. It's important for the church to have that publicity, the, the visual image of, of those clean cut Mormon missionaries who I'm sure look like they are perfect, you know, that they adhere perfectly to the doctrine. That is something that needs to be upheld for the system to keep going forward without question. And um, so, so getting people on missions, getting young men on missions is really important. And then, and then you start looking at how, how important it is for the fathers of these young men, for their sons to go on missions. And when they have power, then they can wield that power to make sure that their sons go on missions, no matter what they've done before. Hmm. I, I, it's even making it, saying it like that makes it sound like um, it's always about covering up. It's sometimes about covering things up and sometimes about pretending that that didn't happen or refusing to believe, refusing to believe women, which is how our culture has operated for forever, you know, until the last couple of years, maybe there's a tiny break. Maybe some women are believed. I, I'm not sure we really, really have changed, but we, we're seems, thinking about it. It seems like, at least from reading your books, there's that just that rigid inflexibility. Um, you know, it's funny because I was reading one of your uh, uh, or listening to a, uh, an interview that you gave recently when you, and you talked about how rigid and inflexible some of the non non believers were. Uh, that was I thought that was pretty cool. Yeah. Well, that was a, I, I think you were talking about my essay on ex-Mormons. Yeah. And, and I five, have become, yes, the five doctrines of ex-Mormonism. Yes, I have yes, become yes. Um, rather disenchanted with ex-Mormonism and have started talking about how it's not really the people who are outside of the church. Ex-Mormonism is really people who grew up Mormon and have left the church formally, but are still very Mormon but can't acknowledge that. Like, I feel like that fits me very well. I, I grew up Mormon. I'm still very much Mormon, even though I don't attend. But I feel like I'm trying to acknowledge the ways in which my Mormonism still comes out in everything that I think in the ways that I interacted with in the world. I, I, that's part of the process of leaving. And it can be a very painful part. Right. Um, 
Well, would you say that, you, you know, these books, you know, it, the process of writing these books, and I wanted to kind of pick your brain a little bit about the crime novel, you know, and why you cho chose this particular genre. Um, have you found that it's kind of been a good way for you to explore your own thoughts about about the church and about um, throughout the course of these books? Was it a, has it been a therapeutic way of dealing with a lot of these questions? I don't know if I would put it that way. Um, so I chose to write mystery because I feel like of all of the genres, mystery gives you a gigantic canvas for character development. That's what I find fascinating about mystery. The great mystery series, 20 or 30 books, and sometimes 20, 30, 40 years of someone's life. And you get to read a book a year and see how that character has changed bit by bit. I mean, there, there are different variants of that. Like the Sue Grafton style is a little bit different where it's all compressed. So she's got the 25 books in the series and then um, the character stays in the same time period generally, but you still get to see an enormous change in her personality over the course of those books, partly because Sue Grafton herself, I assume, changed dramatically as a writer. Um, but I just love that gigantic canvas. For me, I feel like it's a bit of a love story to like homage to Mormonism, where I felt like Mormonism deserved to have that a character who was deeply Mormon with this enormous canvas of, so you can see the life of, of one Mormon character from beginning to, I don't know that it'll, it'll hit the end, but I just wanted to have that scope. That, that, to me, that's what attracts me to mystery. I can't think of another genre that has that kind of scope even, and I used to write fantasy and science fiction and I, those have scope as well, but I don't know that they have the same life character scope that mystery does absolutely well it's always interesting to put people in conflict and see yeah. what and see what happens you know um and i've also i've always thought that uh the crime genre at least you know at its best can give you a look kind of like a street level view of what's going on in american cities and global cities as well but i'm thinking of american crime fiction um you know by looking at these difficult problems you know and it can give you a view of the cities that you know the the uh the regular kind of ivy league themed mfa literary fiction can't often do uh, or maybe does in a different way um but yeah it's an i think that is true um but so before i wrote the linda books i wrote a very weird series of um hmm, how to describe them they're set in salt lake city and they're mystery books, but they have a supernatural element to them. So there's like vampires and Mormons <laughs> together in Salt Lake City. And I remember I pitched that book to a publisher as Salt Lake City. Like here's the chance, the, the great mystery books have like Chicago or New York or LA. And I, I just don't know one that has Salt Lake City and I think Salt Lake City deserved it. But um, the Linda books are more suburban than they are urban. But definitely this book, The Prodigal Daughter, is all Salt Lake City. It's, you know, every, I, I, um, I tried to hit every little block of downtown Salt Lake, which is where I live now. And I wanted to make sure that you, if you've never seen Salt Lake, you will read this book and you will have the feel of, you know, getting to the great downtown library that's there and the track station and, you know, just all the different parts, the mall, the, the, the gateway, the um, the temple itself, everything is there in this book. So she has a little jaunt over to Ogden, though, right? True. Yes, there's a, a little homage short, to though. Ogden there. Yeah, because her son lives in Ogden. I mean, it's this is the trick with writing um, a, lo a long mystery series that everybody has to deal with. It's the murder she wrote problem, right? Where mm. <laughs> you have this character who lives in a small town. How many people can die? and be murdered in a small town, realistically. Wouldn't people just be running away from her because she's, yes, always, she's right. always involved? <laughs> so yeah. I, I pull I pull Linda into a different space than her regular Draper neighborhood. There's already been three murders there. So I was trying to get away from, from that murder capital of Utah. <laughs> right. Well, to give everybody a little hint, I remember um, 
you know, the previous book is called Not of This Fold, which kind of gives us a, a hint of where things are, are headed. Um, although, as you say, they've always been kind of leaning in that direction from the, from the beginning, if you read between some of the lines. Um, the book opens uh, notably with her in a couple's, uh, you know, therapy group. And this kind of brings us back to a little bit about what I alluded to at the beginning about this very insular closed world. This is a, a uh, would you say a church approved counselor? It's not, you know, uh, someone from the outside that's giving them counseling, correct? Yeah, I mean, there are a group of therapists who are, um, I mean, they, they are licensed by the state, but they are largely paid by, for by the church who, who have LDS clients and then bishops and wards pay for this for other people. Um, so yes, it's very much an LDS um, therapist that Linda and Kurt are visiting in the first chapter of the book. Without getting too personal, <laughs> some of that, did some of that, di uh, the dialogue that they have in some of those, or some of the conversations, was there a little bit of reality? Uh, um, honestly, that particular part, I was very, very careful to make sure it had nothing to do with my own personal situation. Yeah. Right. Um, just because that, that, that would have been unfair. I mean, they are in marriage counseling, yeah. but, but the arguments sure. they have have nothing to do with the kinds of arguments I had. Um, cause that, yeah, no, I, I, I couldn't bring myself to do anything that close, but maybe the emotions are the same in the sense that, mm. you know, emotions in the midst of a possible divorce are always running high. And again, the drama, right? I needed to have drama. <laughs> drama <laughs> this drama. is a very dramatic scene that I start the book with. I, this book lacks a murder, right? It doesn't have a body. <laughs> Oh, most mystery books have a body on the first page. And from the beginning, when I first started writing these books, I have played with that convention in every single book. I delay and delay and delay the body on the first page thing. So this is an even further, you know, edging. There's a mystery here. It's just, it's not a murder mystery. Well, I'm just trying to think of the, well, we're not gonna give any spoilers, but um, obviously you're, you're dealing with rape culture. Uh, as you say, and um, there, you know, it's very sad. You know, there's a tragic element to what happens in this book that we won't. Definitely. You know, I mean, it is it is tragedy in, in the true sense of that word. Um, and well, something happens. There's a, a violence that occurs towards the end of the book that we won't get into. But um, yeah, for those of for those of People that are watching, can you kind of just set the stage for a little bit for what's happening in this this book? Well, I mean, the book is is more of a disappearance. Um, that's how I frame it. Uh, so th after the the first scene where there's this marriage counseling, uh, Linda gets a call from her son who lives in Ogden. Again, this is to move her out of Draper. So she goes up to Ogden, and her son's babysitter for his his infant daughter has disappeared. And, so, and her parents are not interested in involving the police. Again, this is a classic thing where when you're writing about an amateur detective, you have to have reasons that the police are not the ones solving the crime. So her parents don't want to call the police. And so Linda is brought in to see if she can find anything out about why this girl has disappeared, where she might be, how she might be convinced to go back home to her parents. And that's what starts Linda on this journey throughout the rest of the book of trying to find this girl. And then when she finds her, trying to figure out is it right to have her go home? And um, what if she's not going home, then what do you do with her? And just a bunch of problems that come up. Well, I mean, you were talking about how, uh, you know, not having them call the police, uh, you know, satisfies a convention of the genre, but by the same token, it's almost like, yes, but her parents, uh, we're talking about the girl, Sabrina, her parents' reaction to her and the way they treat her is very important to the story, I thought, in a way. You know? <laughs> I mean, it's it's one of those things where you have to, as a writer, um, you, you have to f use the tools that are at your disposal and use at your disposal and use them well. So so in this particular case, her parents had to not call the police because 
Linda had to be involved, but then I had to have a darn good reason that wow. the parents didn't call the police. And that was something that I worked on through five or six drafts of this book to make sure. So I'm glad that for you, that that was a good reason. Um, I'm not sure in the first draft that people would have said that because I, I knew that, like I said, it's a, it's a convention of these kinds of books that the parent, that you can't have them call the police in. Um, but I had to have a good reason. <laughs> well, also, uh as a broader, just a broader question, I was, I wanted to ask you a little bit about the intersection of law enforcement and sort of this Mormon culture. I mean, it's, it's a broad description. I mean, it, um, I'm not sure if I actually have a, a, a question framed properly, but, you know, one of the interesting characters in the book is Gwen, you know, um, and she, on her own little, the journey that she's on throughout these books. I mean, she leaves the church and enters the police academy, right? Yeah, um, yeah. But broadly, can you, is there, how does that work, the intersection with law enforcement and Mormonism in, in view of its being a very closed, protected world? I mean, I think that law enforcement in Utah tries to um, keep the church and law enforcement separate. I don't know if they are able to achieve that because it uh it's just everywhere mormonism is everywhere it's hard to not be mormon when you are mormon or a lot so, of the cops mormon i mean everyone a lot of everyone in utah is mormon or mormon right. adjacent um i don't know that there's a larger percentage of cops in utah that are mormon there are a very large percentage of legislators in in utah who are mormon um, and that creates some interesting dynamics within the church and and the the uh, legislature. But um, I I think most of these are unconscious biases. I don't think that that people think to themselves, oh, I'm going to make sure that the Mormon family doesn't get investigated because they're Mormons and they're my friends. That's not what's going on. It's just that you're used to assuming that if you meet a state president, that he's a good guy. And it, those unconscious biases can be hard to investigate. And I suspect, again, they're everywhere. It's not like Mormonism is this special yeah. kind of place. If you know somebody who is a school principal, you know, from your school, you're likely to give them the benefit of the doubt. That's the kind of thing that's going on in law enforcement. There's nothing nefarious. I know too many, um, both non-Mormon and Mormon cops who are just excellent. Sure. Um, at their jobs, but it's just, it's the culture that pervades everything that I think become, makes it difficult to see even your own biases. Well, I guess what I meant is, you know, the kind of the, the, the good old boy power structure that's, that's in place and, you know, maybe some, some subtle sort of nuanced little ways of keeping the status quo going, uh, you know, especially in, I don't know, that's, that's kind of what I was thinking. Uh, <laughs> In this book, I have tried really hard to portray the people who are um, making the, the people in power who are um, covering up. No, that's the wrong word. They are refusing to acknowledge that this um, crime took place. I honestly think, or I, I tried as a writer to write those characters so that it would be convincing that they believed what they were doing. They, they believe that this didn't happen. Um, now, there are reasons that they want to not believe that it happened, but I don't think that they are conscious, the, the characters in the book, and again, most of the Mormons I know, not conscious of um, this bias. They're not conscious of a good good old boy system. That it's. It's there. It's it's definitely there, but it's all unconscious. Well, it's funny. I'm not going to get into too many details here, but I for a while um, I had a, a Mormon girlfriend or a, or one who was a what do you what would you call it a Jack Mormon? That's how she referred, ah the Jack that, Mormon. Uh -huh. That's how she referred to herself, I guess. Um, you know, and uh, we dated for five or six years, and I got an interesting glimpse you know, as from an outsider's perspective into that culture. And, uh, you know, I heard some, heard some pretty interesting things, um, you know, just about, uh, what do I want to say, some of the 
the issues that you deal with in this book, you know, about sexual abuse. And um, again, I don't want to go into details, but uh, it, it was it was an eye opener for me, you know. Um, you know, and of course the, and again, I don't mean any offense to anybody watching. Uh, uh, um, you know, but the LDS community obviously is very strong here in Arizona, especially in, in Mesa. You know, the, um, it, by the way, to interrupt myself, what's the deal with the trampolines? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. It's just good, good, safe, fun, safe in quotes, right? Um, there are just so many trampolines. I, there's a lot of trampolines. There's in a lot of them all over Utah. Yeah. I, yeah. You have when you have a lot of kids, you want to entertain them and preferably sometimes outside of the house. So that to me is the main purpose of the trampoline. <laughs> Go <Yeah>. outside. <laughs> so it is a thing. Yes, definitely. Okay. All right. Um, let's see what else. There were some other good things I wanted to, to grill you about here. Uh, yeah, it's funny. There was you know, towards the beginning of the conversation, we we're talking about or, or you were talking about putting the right balance of detailed information for a non-Mormon reader. And I was reading somebody, a very astute reviewer, I think, who wrote a nice review of one of your books, a really good review. And he was referring to it almost as the balance of crime novel, plot, and anthropology, which I thought was a really interesting way of putting it. Because yeah, I mean, for, for a non-Mormon reader, um, we're curious. We want to know what's what's going on and what some of these uh, what might seem kind of weird practices, uh, what that's all about. I um, back in the day, I watched every episode of of the TV show Bones with my kids. I've I've always loved crime television, but that particular show. Um, I think plays a role in these books because uh, Temperance Brennan is an anthropologist and she's also possibly autistic. <laughs> mm. I don't know that they ever um, use the word autism to describe her, That's but a, she's yeah. very awkward socially, um, blurts things out. She says, um, painfully true things, and she's also clearly very distant from the culture of the the reactions of people around her. And mm. Linda has a little bit of that in her that she is she's a little distant from what's going on, and that enables her to play that role of the anthropologist convincingly enough, I think, for the reader. Um, so Linda, in the first book, she has a best friend but she doesn't have a friend group. And I think you have a sense throughout all of the books that she doesn't, like she and Gwen become friends later, but she's not socially invested in the same way, except through her children, that I think maybe other Mormons would be. And I do think that gives her some distance. And I think that I, that is something I wrote into her from my own experience. When I was became an atheist within Mormonism, I spent a lot of time attending church meetings and trying to make them make sense to someone who was an atheist. So I would realize, oh, they say that, but what they really mean is this, or yep. translated, it means this. And doing that on a regular basis for years enabled me to be able to talk to a non-Mormon audience and try to explain things in a way that I don't know that people who are still who, who haven't had that experience of, of being distant and not believing can do in the way that I was able to do um, and and I spent time after I was atheist for a while I tried to reinvest in the church and believe in a different way and and now I'm not sure where I am I'm kind of in the middle of everything like I say I love Mormonism but I'm not attending right now and um yeah I, I'm, a, I'm an outsider I've always been an outsider. Like I didn't fit in my family. Uh, all the computer people in my family, I just, I never fit in. And that just persisted my whole life. I never fit in in high school. I never fit in at Princeton. <laughs> um, so so I, I feel like that observer lens has always been part of my way of seeing the world. Yeah. I mean, you're getting into some deep stuff here. And what I wanted to ask you about a little bit was 
do you feel comfortable talking about briefly um, where the breaking point was for you? I know that um, it involved oh, sure. personal personal tragedy or loss. Well, I mean, I, I wouldn't. I, my daughter died in two thousand five, and and I did write that into Linda's story because my not in the first draft, but my editor said. I think correctly that when you have an amateur detective who keeps um, in, keeps investigating murder, there has to be a reason that they do that because normal people don't keep putting their nose in dangerous places. So there's there has to be a reason. So I wrote that in for Linda that she has this guilt over her daughter's death, which I also feel over my daughter's death, um, infant daughter. And so, uh, I think one of the things I said in an early interview was that she's pathologically trying to mother every other girl in sight who might, she has a sense, oh, that what might be my daughter. And again, in the prodigal daughter, she bumps up against this girl who she keeps thinking might be my daughter, could could have could been my daughter. Um, so that part is part of my own experience. And losing my daughter did kick me into an, a long, suicidally depressed, and then later atheist phase. But that's not what led me out of the church. Um, the, what led me out of the church was, I think, very specifically the 2015 policy um, against gay marriage that the church right. instituted. And it, it took a long time for me to leave. It took three years after that policy was instituted for me to finally say, I can't go anymore. But what happened immediately was that I started wearing black to church every Sunday because I was in mourning and I was dressing for the funeral. And then I would wear a rainbow ribbon on my, sh on my dress every single week because that was the only way that I could say to myself that I was allowed to, uh, to enter that church space where I felt like there was so much harm being done, mm. but I couldn't keep doing it. It was exhausting and it became so emotionally taxing to feel like the only person in that space every week who would say the words <laughs> and and like i i just was the only person who would stand up and say we've got to do better we can't keep saying that there's no place for gay people in heaven we just have to stop saying that because if you think that no one in your family is gay you're wrong Absolutely. someone that you love is gay and you keep all you're doing is telling them not to tell you that they're gay yeah. and, and forcing them to stay in the closet and just heaping harm on them. And I just couldn't keep doing it. I just, I, I honor and respect the other activists that I know. And some are very dear friends of mine who keep going and they are trying to change the church from within and to stand up and be um, faithful Mormons who continue to to advocate for LGBT rights within the church, but I couldn't do it anymore. It was too much. Yeah, and then now is uh, the the Samuel character kind of a a way of, you know, it's therapeutic for you to kind of deal with him and in the books at all. Samuel is not any one of my children, but I will say that I I have a son who's named Samuel, and um. The Samuel character had a name from some other person in my family. And one of my sisters told me that person in the family would be might be angry at you if you name this gay character after them, and, which is something that had never occurred to me. And so my son Sam said, name him after me. I will be happy to be named af after your gay character in the book. So How cool is he's that? very much an, an ally, but this was when he was, oh, how old was he? 15 or 16? He was, he was just a kid. Um, but he was, he wanted to stand up and say, yeah, name that character after me. I won't be ashamed of that. I'll be proud of it. Um, so Samuel is just a way for me to talk about the many, many um, gay and lesbian and trans and ace and queer and intersex people that I know who haven't been able to stay in Mormonism, even though they've tried and like Samuel, have given everything. They've tried to do every little thing that the church has asked them to do. And ultimately, they you just can't give enough. That is really cool. You know, it's funny, I'm just kind of keeping my eye on some of the questions or comments that are coming in. Um, did you, 
just kind of going off topic for a second. Um, you know, the, the singer, uh, Sinead O'Connor, mm -hmm. you know, have you noticed or have you read anything about this new memoir that she has? I'm not sure. I just read a tiny little bit of it. Um, and that made me say, oh, I should go and look at that. Yeah. I do not listen to very much music. It is a very strange thing of me. I listen to audiobooks when I run and exercise, but never listen to music. I find music distracting. Mm. Like I can't think while music is on. <laughs> So I, I was not a fan of her music, but I am very interested in her story. Yeah, see that, I mean, that's why I bring it up. You know, she, you know, famously, I remember reading something that she wrote, uh, she wrote about, or maybe she said in an interview about, you know, very famously ripping up the, on Saturday Night Live and going against the Catholic position, you know, which has a of course in Ireland is very, very long, you know, well-established and, going up against the dogma and, you know, some of those same things. But she said something about how she was obsessed or she was in love with the Holy Spirit, you know? Um, I thought that was really interesting because it, you know, there's this division between dogma and what this is all supposed to be talking about, you know, the great mystery, um, you know, that mystical, aspect and so that interested me and I, I know that she subsequently got into uh you know hinduism in a big way and you know explored some different things so not to digress but that should be an interesting memoir to, to yeah check. yeah totally interesting my kids say that i'm a buddhist now but i'm not sure i'm really practicing any form of spirituality i i've been working 60 hour weeks at my new job just trying to keep my head above water and <laughs> So I don't have time for anything other than that and my triathlon. And it's just like, mm. what's your new job? I work for Fidelity, a financial investment place. So totally okay. different. I, it's not like this is what I trained for. Although if I had known how many tests they would ask you to take in order to be a financial advisor, if I'd known that when I was 18, I might have gone into this to begin with because I love taking tests. There's nothing I like more than taking tests. It's like a dessert at the end of the day. And you get to take a hundred question, multiple choice test now because you finished all your work for today. Yay, I love it. <laughs> <laughs> a little left brain action there. Yes, you're right. Yep, that is with the yeah. left brain coming back into play. Well, I mean, let me just ask you one more question here and then I can address some of these questions. Uh, from the viewers, um, what does a you know a person, especially a woman, let me say a woman, not specifically, what can a woman who leaves the church expect in terms of well, in terms of what what do they? I mean, they're losing it all, right? I mean, the community, the support. I mean, it's a tremendously uh, courageous step. I think that women who leave lose more than men, although I, I've definitely heard the argument that men lose more because they have more position in the church to lose and women are further down. But the problem, and I've written an essay on this, the problem for women who leave the church, especially when you're older, is that you can't, getting a job is very, very difficult. And I talk to many women who've left Mormonism or who are divorced um, and on some spectrum of, of Mormonism. And it's when you have been a stay-at-home mom for your entire life and are suddenly in the position of now at an advanced age trying to support yourself, that is, it's, I, I did not know, nor did I expect how difficult that that would be. In addition, so that's layered on top of the sense of unmooring from family, community, and for most of us, even the physical location of your home um, where you have raised your kids, it's, it's a lot. It's a lot to deal with. For me, this all happened in the midst of the pandemic as well. So <laughs> I, I got to have it in a space where even the friends that I did have outside of the church I couldn't see or visit in any meaningful way. Um, so I, the last year of my life has been really, really hard. Um, just like I say, I feel like I'm just barely keeping my head above water. If it appears from my post on Facebook 
that somehow I'm winning at this game. I'm not. <laughs> I cry a lot. I feel sad a lot. Um, and I'm trying to rebuild, but it's, I don't know that I'll ever be able to rebuild what I lost. And and I and the the longer I'm in my the space that I'm in now, the more that I see that so many of us are in the same space. I, I hear some ex-Mormon men wandering around saying a lot that they're so much happier now that they've left Mormonism. But I don't hear ex-Mormon women saying that as much. Um, and I I can't say that. I wish almost every day that I could go back. I I loved being Mormon. Um, I, I can't go back but I, I do wish it a lot. I wish I could go back to being the person that I used to be who was certain of everything, that I had all the answers. And my life felt like I, you know, I was doing everything right, um, but I, I can't go back. You can't unsee the stuff. And so yeah. I, now I just have to move forward. And, and that's the way we all have to, we're all having to do that now after right. the pandemic, so. Well, I mean, you all, you're also, um... You know, as I said, how, how courageous the book and your own personal story, you're giving a voice to a whole lot of people who don't have one, you know, traditionally. Um, so I hope that that is true. Um, when you feel isolated on a daily basis, it, it can sometimes feel like it, if that's true, it doesn't matter. <laughs> but um, I, I will try to lean more into I am courageous and not, I was really dumb. There, there are a lot of days when I just think that was really dumb. Why did you do that? Why did you destroy your own life in the way in which you did? <laughs> and my, I don't have a good answer for that other than I had to be me. Yeah. I, I ultimately had to live with the integrity that I was born with and it led me here. And I'm gonna try to make this space a good space that I'm in now. Let's see. So let's see here. The people who are looking. Um, Tamarin asks, how might I get your signed book? Well, Tamarin, we have signed copies. We just got them. And uh, yay. Yeah. I so shipped them back. <laughs> beautiful signed copies. And you can give us a call and put the link in, but I can't seem to figure out how to do it while I'm talking to Meti here. But if you, if you just go to poisonedpen.com uh, on our website or give us a call, we'd be happy to, happy to hook you up. Uh, let's see here. Laura says, murder she wrote man ran for many years, but I'm not sure I, I would have wanted to befriend her, Angela Lansbury, as everyone around her seemed to have an untimely demise. They were either killed or they were the murderer, right? Or they were That's accused right. of murder, yeah. That's like, you know, I, I never understood with the Friday the 13th franchise, you know, it's like if all the kids last year were killed by some <laughs> madman, why the blank would you want to go back to this camp the next year? But that's just me. Uh, let's see here. Janet asks, uh, well, I think you've addressed this already. What has caused you to think that you are an atheist? Now that you're discussing your daughter's death, is that the cause? Blah, blah, blah. Well, you just went into that in great detail. No, no, actually, I do have a, a further explanation. Okay. So um, when I asked people around me for the spiritual answer of like, why did this happen to me? I felt like the answer that I got was that this was part of a plan and that there was a lesson for me to learn from it. Um, that led me to become suicidal because it felt like behind that was the message that my daughter had to die in order to teach me a lesson, that there was no other way that I was either too stubborn or too stupid to learn the lesson I needed to learn. It, the only way I could do it was if my daughter died, my infant daughter who was completely innocent. That made me feel like I had to be the most terrible person that was ever on the planet if the only way to save me was to kill a baby. Um, and then after I sort of work through my suicidal thoughts around that, I eventually decided, well, what kind of a God would do that? And I decided, oh, I can't believe in that God. That God is, um, forgive me, forgive my French, but a sadistic bastard. <laughs> and I, I refused to worship him. So I was an atheist for a long time because I couldn't conceive of a different God 
than that the one that would have chosen to plan to have my daughter die in order to teach me a lesson. I did eventually, I have eventually come around to believing in a different God sometimes. Um, it's, it's not the same as that firm belief that I had before. So I wouldn't call myself an atheist now. I would call myself a sometimes believer. And sometimes I believe absolutely and other times I don't. It just comes up and down. Amen. I can re I can identify with that. Uh, let's see. Uh, okay. I think that's about it. There's just some comments and things like that. People watching. Um, so where do you go from here with Linda? What's uh, what can we expect with book six? Well, um, this book was originally intended to be book six, and um, my publisher ended up flipping what oh. the, the original book five um which is a story about samuel um going awol from his mission <laughs> nice. i don't want to say too much about that but but something happens and he flies home without the permission of his mission president and he comes home to help linda with an investigation um so that one hopefully will still come out and then I have another one that I just wrote recently about um, Kurt um, getting involved in a murder instead of Linda, where um, he starts having questions about the church, even though, you know, in this book, he's very firmly attached to the church. He starts having his own questions on different issues, and he starts asking higher up leaders, and it gets him in trouble, and then there is a murder. <laughs> Ooh. So wow. we'll see, we'll see what comes up after this. Very cool. Yeah, maybe a, also a Samuel spinoff would be kind of cool. You know, he <laughs> takes, takes the baton. Yeah. I have a short story that Gwen narrates um, after she becomes a police officer. Um, I, I, I don't know if she's as interesting of a narrator as Linda, though. So I don't know. I, I think I'll probably stick with Linda. Do you, is the Gwen story in third person or first? It's in first, in first. but it's not published. So, uh, sorry, you can't read it anywhere. But but it's I've, to, I've toyed with different different narrators. Wow, well, very exciting. Um, well, Medi, it's been a it's been a real treat to talk with you. Thank you so much for thanks. doing this interview. Appreciate yeah. it. Yeah, thanks for spending the hour. I told you. one of my friends when he asked about the poison pen. I said. They are the best independent bookstore I've ever been to. So oh, just, thank you so much. That's really, great. We really appreciate it. And uh, we'd love to get you back down here, you know, as, as we start to open up more and more. Be nice to have another in-person gig here. Yep, that would be great. You yeah. tell me when. <laughs> you bet. All right. All right. Thanks, everybody, for watching. And uh, congratulations again, Mehdi, on this terrific new book. Thank and, you. Uh, we will we'll stay in touch. Okay. All right, take care. Hello, we hope you're enjoying our programs and podcasts with authors. We'd like to expand them and your help would be appreciated. Please make a donation at poisonedpenfoundation.org. 100% of the proceeds will go to help connect authors with readers in this difficult time. Thank you.